We are, we are excited for discipleship happening here at, at Legacy Family Church. We're so excited to be able to pour into the lives of the people that God has entrusted us to. And I want to uh, let you guys know that Wednesday night we also have a midweek service. And the way it's structured is we all come together, but then we, we, we break off and the men go to the men's Bible study, the women go to the women's Bible study, the children go with the children's, and the youth go to the youth ministry. And we all minister uh, collectively and then come back and we all share what God has put on our heart that night. It's a beautiful time of, of discipleship and growing in the Lord. So I invite you guys, if you haven't come out to a Wednesday night, to join us and uh, just see what the Lord is doing midweek. Amen? Amen? Turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 15. Matthew, chapter 15. During this month, we've been talking about uh, the importance of fasting and prayer as we continue on this journey. I don't know about you all, but every year that we do this, there's an extra portion of God that just seems to drop into my spirit. And he gives great revelation. He gives me greater understanding. He gives me greater dominion over those areas of my life. You know how your old man always tries to creep up? It's like you pull out all the weeds and then every once in a while one tries to... Man, he just cleans everything out and there's a renewing and a refreshing of our mind and of, of our spirit. So if you have not engaged in this fast, I, I implore you, I encourage you, I exhort you, join us. Put down social media. Stop watching the TV for a little while. You don't need it. Your body just thinks you need it. You, you literally get addicted to that stuff, and it, and it numbs our senses and keeps us from being able to properly hear the voice of God. So put those things down. Also, the Bible tells us that a true fast is putting down food. So you can fast in different ways. You can do a sun up to sundown fast, so you don't eat during the day. You just eat at night, and maybe you get up early in the morning to have something, but you dedicate that time that you would be eating to prayer and time in the Word. And I'm telling you, the Lord speaks to you. The Lord breaks through. The Lord does things in your life. He's been doing that with me and my family. And actually, on February 4th, that night that we break fast, we're going to have a testimony service. So if God has spoken something to you, if he's done something in your life, we're going to have you come forward, and we're just going to share testimonies of what God has done to break through during this time. Amen? Amen. But I wanted to speak to you on a different topic tonight, and we find it here in Matthew chapter 15. Beginning at verse 1, would you stand to your feet as we read the word of God tonight? Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your, disi your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Then Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of 
the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord God, that they would come together tonight in concert to teach us what it is that you are speaking to us in this season. Lord, I offer myself simply as a vessel to be used by you to minister to your people. I pray that we would all leave here tonight encouraged, built up, Lord God, and ready to become more and more like you, Lord Jesus, and ambassadors to this world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we're fasting and watching what we put in our mouths, this last week, God put it on my heart that as we are doing that, we also need to watch what's coming out of our mouth, as the Lord Jesus instructs us in this passage. Our fast is all about getting closer to Jesus. It's about getting closer to God. It's about putting down those things that are so loud and are competing for our attention, putting them aside so we can hear the Lord. So we can know his will for our lives. So we can break through those areas that we need breakthrough in. So we are guarding what we eat and purposing to to discipline our bodies. But one of the greatest disciplines that we can have is the discipline of controlling our tongue. Jesus said that defilement comes from what we speak out. What we say defiles us more than what we eat. So if we're fasting this month and denying ourselves what we eat, but then out of our heart is coming things that are not uh, appropriate or those things that are contrary to the word of God, they are contrary to the God that we are pursuing, then that can hinder our walk through this fast. There's some, some interesting things about our, our, our speech and the words in our mouth. I just looked up some, some interesting things that I wanted to share with you all tonight. Just totally random, but I thought it was fun. You know, they always say, think before you speak. And as I look back over my life, I'm like, man, if I would have just put that into practice, even 50% of the time, I could have avoided so many things. And if you're laughing, it's because you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like you're saying something. You're in the middle of an intense fellowship with your spouse. And something's about to come out. And you could stop it. And you're like, so you be birthday. And it's like, what am I doing? If I say that, that's six months of trying to reel it back in. It's already out there. It's already out there. It's too late. It's too late. So many times we find ourselves in that position. Sometimes we we talk too fast and think too slow. Fastest talkers in the world. It used to be held by a gentleman named John Moshida Jr. He used to do those micro machine commercials back in the day, FedEx, any 80s kids, 80s, 90s kids, you remember this guy? He would talk like this really fast and he had the mustache and everything. He held the record, he could speak 586 words per minute. 580, I can't think of 586 words in five minutes. But this guy is spitting them out. 586 words per minute. But his record was broken in 1990 by a gentleman named Steve Woodmore, who spoke 637 words in one minute. That only lasted five years, because then a gentleman by the name of Sean Shannon spoke 655 words per minute on August 30th, 1995, and crushed it. I'm not so much impressed with how fast they spoke, but your ability to comprehend what you're saying. I'm like, I bet you these guys get into a lot of trouble. They just said, oh yeah, but oh, sorry, that just slipped out. No, it flew out. And ever something, you know, it didn't slip out, but it flew out of your mouth. And you're like, oh, man, that's going to come back painful. Thought it was interesting. Um, 
There have been studies that have done uh, about how much women talk versus how much men talk. One such study says that women say about 13,000 more words per day than men. 13,000 more words per day than men, on an average. Don't say anything. Look straight ahead. One of front said, that's because we have to repeat ourselves. Let alone. As my auntie used to say, let alone. Talking requires, listen, talking requires the use of dozens of muscles in the lips, throat, and tongue. But speaking in a normal tone is no more tiring than sitting in silence. In other words, you can talk and talk and talk, and those muscles don't get tired. Sometimes you wish they would get tired, but they don't get tired. Dr. Nicholas Elmer, a British psychologist, argued that up to 80%, listen to this, up to 80% of average conversations consist of gossip. 80% of conversations consist of gossip. Let that sit in for a minute. Now, he argues that gossiping is a, just a, a part of our humanity, and it's almost essential and necessary. The Bible says otherwise. Research, uh, research shows that most individuals spend 60% of their conversation time talking about themselves. Kind of makes sense. I mean, that's what you know about the most. This number jumps to 80% while conversing on social media. It's funny, but the Bible says that in the end of days, men would be lovers of themselves. The word glossalia refers to a sudden ability uh, to speak in a previously unknown language. They have a scientific term for that. The Bible calls this the gift of tongues. But they actually have a word. It's the sudden, I don't know why they say it's the sudden ability. Who suddenly knows how to speak another language? Why don't we just call it the spiritual ability to, to speak another language that you did not previously know? This is a gift of the Spirit as evidence in Acts chapter 2. Amen. About 25% of people report suffering from glossophobia, the fear of public speaking. 10% absolutely terrified to where it can be physically debilitating to get up and speak. Psychologist uh, Albert Murabian argued that speaking actually makes up a relatively small portion of communication. He argued that communication is roughly 55% body language, 38% tone of voice, and 7% words used. I would tend to agree with that. When I was growing up, when we were in trouble, mom and dad didn't have to say anything. They gave you the look. That said it all. And since the advent of texting... Uh, text messaging, people talk less on the phone. A 2015 study found that the average American sends or receives five times as many texts compared to phone calls. So now we don't even talk to each other anymore. And finally, this one was interesting. Many people pace while they're talking on the phone. Sometimes people pace when they're just talking. Psychologists believe this may be a sort of coping mechanism to make up for a lack of body language and nonverbal cues that normally accompany conversation. So your body's trying to process information, and because it doesn't, it, you pace because you can't see their eyes, you can't read their body language, you don't know what they're really saying. All you have to interpret is just the words and their tone. So you, you get anxious, kind of, because you don't know what they're saying, so you pace back and forth. I thought that was pretty interesting. The point of this is that our words are powerful and a very big part of our life. With our words, we can build up or break down. We can bless or we can curse. We can divide or we can unite. We can hurt or we can heal. We can condemn or we can comfort. We can coerce or we can gently correct. 
Our words are powerful. Turn in your Bibles to James chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 12. James, one of my favorite books in the Bible, simply because he, like many of the other apostles, cuts right to the chase, does not mince words, and hits you right in the heart. Verse 1, James 3, chapter, uh, yeah, James chapter 3. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, or mature, able also to bridle the whole body. The Bible says a perfect man. That word perfect simply means mature. When you think of someone who's mature, what are some of the characteristics that come to mind that allow you to identify them as someone who is mature? Self Patient? Self-control. Self -control. What's that? A good listener. Absolutely. Their posture. They stand straight and strong. According to the scriptures, maturity comes along with knowing how to control your mouth. It's the ability to want to say something but not say it because you're able to foresee the consequence. It's the ability to control your emotions so your emotions don't get you in trouble with your tongue. It's the ability to pause and think before we speak. It says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Woo! It says, for every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt and fresh water. The Lord is writing through James and saying, look, we got to control our mouth. Again, he reiterates what Christ said in that whatever comes out of our mouth can defile us. What does it mean to defile that word defile, it means to muddy, to dirty, to make unclean. You can be going good. And you say one thing out of your mouth, and all of a sudden it just ruined everything. It can ruin a, rep, uh, a relationship. It can ruin a reputation. Just, just one thing out of the mouth. So God encourages us to watch what we are saying. Watch the words that come out of our mouth. We see all throughout scripture, both good and bad examples. We see good and bad examples of what happens when you, when you open your mouth and what comes out when you open it. Turn in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 14. We're going to look at verse 26. I'm going to move quickly here so you can turn there. I'm just going to go ahead and, and start reading. Numbers chapter 14, verse 26. So when we come to uh, Numbers chapter 14, we have the children of Israel. They have made it through the desert. And now they stand on the edge of their promise. They, they've come out of Egypt. They've passed through the Red Sea. They've gone through the desert. They come up to their promise. God says, time to go in. They send spies in to spy out the land. 
12 spies. And they come back and they're bringing grape, uh, grape bundles and all these things, talking about how good the land is, but they're like, but we can't do it. There's giants in the land. We can't do it. Only two of the 12, Joshua and Caleb, they stood up and said, be quiet. Oh, yes, we can. The Lord said we can do it. We are able to do it. But everybody else, the Bible says that they saw themselves as grasshoppers in their own sight. Not in their sight. They saw themselves as grasshoppers. And as a result of their rebellion and their refusal to obey God and go into their promise, the Lord speaks thus to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? What was, his, what was his problem with the children of Israel? They're always complaining. It was the words of their mouth. We don't have any water, gives them water. We don't have any bread, gives them manna all day, all night. Well, we got manna and we got water, but we don't have any meat. I'm going to give you quail and you're going to get sick of it. Always constantly complaining. No matter what God did, it was never enough for them. So it was the words of their mouth that entangled them. And they complained against the Lord. How long shall I bear with this evil? He doesn't say this immature. He didn't, he didn't say this annoying. He said evil. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints with the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me. Listen, one of the principles that we, we understand when we're reading the word is repetition. If God says something more than once, he's trying to make a point here. Three times he's talked about them complaining. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who are numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above. God says, all right, y'all complaining all the time? You're going to wander in the desert for 40 years until everybody that's 20 years old and above, y'all die out because y'all are a bunch of complainers. I can't work with that. The words of your mouth are not in agreement with the promises that I've made. Your words are contrary to the promises that I've made. Keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that. That's, a, that's an important point a little bit later. So what do they do? They wander through the wilderness for 40 years. Let, let me say this real quick. As an encouragement, not a condemnation, please understand my heart. If you find yourself in a rut in the same thing over and over and over again, and you haven't been able to get out, maybe you should check your words. Maybe the Lord is allowing you to continue to circle in that place until the words of your mouth start shifting to the promises that he's made. Oh, well, my marriage this, my marriage that. Have you... Change the words that you're speaking about your spouse? Man, well, my, my job is X, Y, and Z. Are you complaining against the job that God has given you in order to provide for your needs? Change the words of your mouth. Starts with, now, I'm not saying that you don't acknowledge nonsense. Amen? Can we say amen to that? Amen. It's okay to acknowledge nonsense. Hey, my boss is crazy. That's okay. You can say that. My boss is out of their mind, but you know what? God loves them, and I'm going to determine to be a good witness to them. So you can acknowledge nonsense. We just don't dwell on it and speak it over and over and over again. Amen. we got to speak the promises of God and not just our experiences. If we just keep speaking our experiences, we're just going to continue to experience that over and over and over again. Now listen to what, listen to what God did. After 40 years. So 40 years goes by, and now all of those people have passed away that God was waiting to die off. And I, and I love God because <laughs> he could have opened up the ground and just swallowed everybody. That was one. I was like, God, why didn't you just take care of it right then? He's like, oh, no, 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 no. Because I needed 40 years for the next generation to build up so that they wouldn't fall into the same mess. See, the people that came out of Egypt had a problem. They came out of Egypt, but Egypt didn't come out of them. In Egypt, they were in slavery and they were in bondage. And the entire time, they were complaining about how bad things were. 
And then they get out into the wilderness. And what do they do? They're, they now have the habit of complaining. They're complaining that they were set free. Y'all are over here complaining about being in bondage. Now you're complaining about being set free. You're complaining about having no food. Now you're complaining about the food you got. I'm done. That's a wrap. God's like, I, I'm, I'm not going to do anything with that. So this next generation, they didn't have Egypt in them. God had to wait for all of them to pass away because he needed a new generation that was going to have a new perspective. See, when you have a new perspective, you have new words that come out of your mouth. All they knew is that God had been taking care of them thus far. And they also knew, I'm not going to end up like them. Anybody have older siblings? You see your older sibling get in trouble? All of a sudden, ding, I'm not going to do that. Wisdom comes in. So in Joshua chapter 6, Joshua, Moses passes away. Moses wasn't able to enter into the land because he got himself into a place where he was being disobedient. God told him to speak to the rock, and he struck the rock. He took things into his own hands. I was like, God, that was kind of a, I mean, Moses did a lot here. Couldn't you give him a grace on that one? He's like, nope. I'm not bringing that mindset into the, into the promised land. I can't afford to have that because that stuff spreads like, what did James say? Wildfire. That spreads like wildfire. I can't even have Moses. With all the stuff that he did, he slipped into that mindset of being disobedient, did something I told him not to do. He'll bring that in. I want this to be pure. So he raises up Joshua. And Joshua sees the angel of the Lord, and he tells him how to overcome Jericho. And they're getting ready to do it. So they cross over the Jordan, does miracles, establishes Joshua in front of him, just as he was with Moses, so he is with, with Joshua. Everybody's terrified, and God gives them instructions, and we know what it is. You gotta, you gotta walk around Jericho one time for six days, and then on the seventh day, walk around it seven times, and then shout. But listen to what Joshua commands the people in Joshua 6:10. Now, Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, Shout. Then you shall shout. He put them on a seven-day talking fast. Everybody thinks that it was just in that moment. No. For seven days, don't speak a word. Why? Because he doesn't want the negativity and the nonsense coming out of their mouth. Gosh, man, why are we walking around this city? This doesn't make sense. I've never seen anybody do this. This isn't how we took care of the Amorites over there, Og over there. We took care of them, no problem. How come we're not doing it that long? Yeah, you know what? What Barry said was right. Yeah, we should be doing this another thing. Oh, my gosh. Hey, did you hear what Johnny said? Oh, my gosh. And Linda, was. she's in agreement. We're all in agreement. And all of a sudden, you got the rebellion of Korah again, and God's got to open up the ground and swallow everybody. Redo. Josh is like, I saw my elder in his mistake. We're not doing that. You all, be quiet. Don't say a word. Not one word. Don't even say hi. Just zip it for seven days. If you will zip it for seven days, we can get our promise. Don't ruin it. You want to go back to the wilderness? This is the paraphrased version, of course. <laughs> you want to go back there? Mm-mm. Then, uh. Seven days, didn't say a word. And we saw what happened. We saw God perform a mighty deliverance on one of the most fortified cities of Canaan. And that was their first battle. They took out the biggest obstacle first time out. Woo, why? Because they kept their mouth shut. Now they have this victory to talk about. See, they didn't, they didn't have much to talk about yet. But now they have something to talk about. And God said, OK, now you can open your mouth because we're going to speak from a place of victory. You got victory to talk about. You have an experience. You've seen this. You, you guys didn't see all of the stuff I did before, but you've seen this. Now talk about this. God gave them something to talk about. Until they had something, it was zip it. Turn to Luke chapter 1. We see, we see this talking fast again. Luke chapter 1. We see the account of John the Baptist's father, Zacharias. Luke chapter 1, we'll start at verse 18. So just to, to bring you up to speed here, Zacharias was a priest, 
It was his turn to go and light the altar of incense in the temple. They did this in a rotation based on the families and based on the month. So it was Zacharias' turn to go in. And the angel Gabriel appears to him during this time. And he tells him this incredible prophecy about the son that he and his wife Elizabeth are going to have in their old age. I mean, and this, is, this guy, he is a, a part of the priesthood. He knows the story of Abraham. He knows that this is something that God has done. But in verse 18, we see an exchange here between Zacharias and an angel. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. So you have an angel of God standing in front of you, telling you God personally, you got a personal visitation from an angel, and you question them with the words of your mouth? Needless to say, Gabriel did not take too kindly to this. Verse 19, and the angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel, hello, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Zacharias, I just gave you good news. I am an angel come from the very presence of God to give you a personal message, and you meet me with complaining and doubt. No talking. No talking. For nine plus months, he was mute and not able to talk. Because God was like, I don't need your doubt. I don't need your complaining. I don't need your unbelief. I just need you to zip it. Let me grow my prophet in the womb of your wife without you mumbling and complaining the entire time. Baby boy does not need to hear that while he's in there you're going to be quiet. So he puts him on a nine-month talking fast, and he doesn't speak until he confirms the name of his son, John, after he is born. We see so many places where our words got people in trouble. Joseph told his brothers his dream. We need to use discretion on not just the information that comes out of our mouth, but who we share it with sometimes. You don't need to tell everybody all your business. We see this with Hezekiah with boasting. Hezekiah brings the Babylonians in and shows them all the treasures of Judah. Yeah, come and see all my stuff. What did they do? Showed up a a few decades later and took it all. Like, thanks for the info, bro. I'll take that and that and that. Opened up his mouth. Samson. This is probably the dumbest the dumbest of all the examples. Sister sitting there asking him, how do I make you weak and overcome you? Not even trying to hide it. Just blatant out there with it. And he's toying with her. Oh, you know, if you tie me up with bow strings. Oh, if you weave my hair into a loom. Oh, I'm weak. <laughs> and then finally, she just pesters him. And he spills the beans. Gets himself a haircut and a one-way ticket to the presence of the Lord via pillars. Why? Because he opened up his mouth. Peter denied Jesus. And for that moment, lost his relationship with him. He was no longer with God. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. He was not saved. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he said, go tell my disciples and Peter. He wasn't one of them anymore. But God, in his grace and his mercy, as Peter denied him with his words, he redeemed him with those very same words and said, Peter, do you love me? And three times he said yes, and he was redeemed. God is full of mercy. Just as quickly as we can speak death, he can come in and bring life if we will get in agreement with his promise. We fall short in slander. We fall short in gossip, lies, and hypocrisies, and all types of things. But God knows the weakness of our flesh and family. He's already made provision for us. A lot of times we don't know what we ought to say. So what is it that we say then? What do we say when we don't know what to say? What do we say and what do we do when those words that are boiling in our heart are about to come out? How do we manage that? I'm glad you asked. Matthew. I'm sorry, let's go to Mark. Mark 11, 23 and 24. Jesus gives us some pointed instructions here. Now, we're going to read this, 
But I have some things to share with you in regards to it, because unfortunately, this is a, a scripture that has been taken so far out of context that it has brought ruin into many people's lives in relationship with the Lord. Verse 22, we'll start there. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, let me say this. A lot of people have taken this and spun it into an unhealthy doctrine that turns it into a, a metaphysical manifestation principle where you can just speak things into being. Oh, well, we're made in God's image and likeness and we can just create things. Mercedes, 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 Mercedes. We're just trying to manifest stuff all the time. I'm in perfect shape without having to go to the gym. I'm in perfect shape without having to go to the gym. My McDonald's fries are blessed and they have no calories in them. I've heard people pray like that. People praying over, Father, I thank you for this double cheeseburger with extra bacon and avocado and mayonnaise. I thank you that all calories are good and go straight to my muscles. Jesus' name. You are out of your loving mind. It does not work like that. Let me just tell you right now, straight up. It does not work like that. People have taken this to a whole other level. You go up to somebody and say, man, I got a headache. No, you don't. You have the symptoms of a headache, but you don't actually have a headache. You are healed. No, I got a headache, bro. My head hurts. It is pounding. You want me to lie? I got a God of truth. I'm not lying. My head hurts. That's the type of craziness that we've stepped into here. Now, I'm not going to get in a room. Yeah, I've got a headache, but you know what? I believe that by the wisdom of God, even, even the, the power of the Holy Spirit, that I can be healed, and I'm going to receive that. And you don't need to smack somebody upside the head or drop kick them, and they fall down, and they got to heal. No, sometimes you just need to get a glass of water because you're dehydrated. How's that for a spiritual revelation? You know that God operates in the spirit, and he created the natural, and there's some natural things that we got to do sometimes. Well, you know, I'm just, I'm just so anxious about everything. I'm just so anxious. How many cups of coffee have you had today? I don't know. How about you stop drinking coffee and then maybe the anxiety will go down because it's a central nervous system stimulant and you're on like nine like that. Your, eye, your pupils don't dilate anymore. You just How about you do that? You're trying to pray over your coffee. Lord, I thank you that this is not decaf coffee. I mean, this is decaf coffee in the name of Jesus, even though it's caffeinated, but you're making it decaf and it'll taste exactly the same. Amen. Wrong. There's actually some discipline that we have to employ here. Family? That's, that's kind of how it works. Are you all with me? So you don't just get to go up and say whatever you want, and then, it, and then it happens. That's not how it works. You got things like the secret and manifest this and all this kind of junk, and the universe is going to give you that and that. No, it's not. You know who's giving you stuff when you move away from God? The devil. The devil still is the God of this world. He'll give you stuff just to make you think you're closer to God than what you really are, when God didn't want you to have it. Devil doesn't care if you call him the devil or you call him God. He just doesn't want you worshiping God. He wants you off track. So he'll give it to you. He'll give you away. But God, God has specific things that he wants for you. So how, how do we take what Jesus is saying here and then bring it all together with the whole of Scripture and apply it to our lives? Turn to John chapter 12, verse 49. Go quickly. This is Jesus speaking. So we have to, we, we cannot take one scripture out of context and try and make a doctrine out of it, make a teaching out of it. We have to understand all of scripture. This is why we need to read the entire Bible and not just the verse of the day. The verse of the day is great, but that is the appetizer to the meal. If you just get the verse of the day, then you're getting part of, of what God is speaking as truth, or you may have it twisted and it's a completely different truth. So John 12, 49 puts things in a better perspective. Jesus says this, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. So what should we say and what should we speak? The things that the Father said. 
See, when we say what God wants us to say, then we get what God wants us to have. There is no power that you have within your tongue to manifest things in your life except that which God has given you. There are limitations to this scripture because of the whole of scripture. Now, make no mistake, your words have power. Your, your words have a lot of power, especially, especially us as parents. As parents, we have the ability to speak blessing or curse into our children's life. What we tell them they are, they will believe it. Careful with the words that you speak over your children. Speak encouragement to them. Son, you're a champion. You're an overcomer. Daughter, you are, you're a handmaiden of the Lord. You have a sweet and gentle heart. I love that about you. Speak life over them. If you're always yelling at them and calling them names, what do they think they're going to be? Well, dad, the one who gives me my identity, says I'm X, Y, and Z. I must be X, Y, and Z. Your words have power. This is why it was so important, the Father's blessing in Genesis. For those of you who are reading the Bible through in a year, you are in Exodus now. But you think back to, to Genesis. We're, we're reading about Abraham blessing his his son Isaac. We're reading about Isaac blessing Jacob in, instead of Esau. And it wasn't like he could just go, oh, I take that back. I get, no, once a blessing was spoken, it was, it was a spiritual principle. It was a law put into place. We see Jacob speaking over Joseph and his brothers before he passes away in Egypt, and he prophesies over all of them, and all of it came true. The words that we speak over our children, husbands that we speak over our wives, wives that you speak over your husband, be careful with them. They have meaning, they carry power, and they resonate in the soul of that individual, and that will bring forth fruit. Absolutely. So be careful with that. But in, but in terms of our life and those things that we speak, we, we get an agreement with what God says. That's where there's power. There's power in the word of God, not in our words, when it comes to our life. Amen? Amen. We see a powerful examples of this all throughout Scripture as well. Jacob blessing his children, as I mentioned. Abraham bless, speaking blessing. We see David and Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Goliath comes out talking all of that mess. And what is it? A little teenage shepherd boy goes, who is this dude? Who does this guy think he is? Little, little redhead with some attitude. Reminds me of someone. Got Goliath out here, everybody else shaking in their boots. And what does he say? The second he walks up, what do I get when I take out this uncircumcised Philistine? What is the, what is the king promising? Because I know he's promising something. You get the king's daughter and your family's exempt from taxes. He's like, hot dog, let's do this. I, I would have done it just for principle. But I'm going to do it knowing that I get something. And then they tried to call him prideful. They tried to call him arrogant because he believed in God. Oh, you're prideful and arrogant. No, I just believe what God says. You know, it's interesting. David called him an uncircumcised Philistine three times. Remember the principle of repetition. What was he saying when he called him an uncircumcised Philistine three times? He's saying, you don't have a promise from God. I have a promise from God. It wasn't based on David's arrogance and his attitude and his training in the field. His faith was in what God had said. He said that with blessing, I will bless you and cursing, I will curse you. He said, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you are cursed. He's looking at this guy. He's like, oh, you're dead meat. You're cursed because you cursed us. I got victory. He looked to the covenant and the word of God and not to his own ability. Are you looking to your own ability or are you looking to the promises and the word of God and what he said? Because if God said it, we can repeat it and we will receive it. Amen. So while we're fasting, we have to take time to make sure that we are filling ourselves with the word of God. See, what goes in is what's going to come out. Garbage in, garbage out. Faith in, faith out. Word in, word out. Peace in, peace out. Hope in, hope out. Love in, love out. 
That's how it works. So this is why we're putting down social media and all that. It's garbage. I don't care how entertaining it is. It's absolute garbage. And we'll, and we'll tolerate it because it gives us an adrenaline or dopamine boost when we're watching these things because it puts us into an emotional state. We get drawn into this world. That's crazy. Now, I'm not saying you can't watch movies or any of that stuff, but you all know what I'm talking about. There's a line that, that gets crossed habitually. We've got habitual line crossing going on. And then we're wondering why these things flow out of us. But there's a manifestation that's not godly in our life. During this fast, we are shutting that stuff off, but then pouring in the word of God. We're pouring in prayer. We're pouring in the spirit of God. We're hanging around people who will speak life. Please guard how you talk to each other. Watch out for coarse jesting and all those things. I know it's common to like, you know, back in the day, you used to play the, dumb, uh, the dozens. You, you know, your mama's this, your mama's that, and all that kind of stuff. It's like, look, come out. Let's, let's not talk about the handmaidens of the Lord who gave life on this earth. You know? We got we to gotta watch that stuff. We think it's no big deal. But look at our world. Look at our world. This world is a result of the words that people are getting in agreement with. We got all kind of confusion happening right now. You know, the, it's, it's like the old adage says, you say a lie enough, it becomes true. We are watching that happen right in front of our faces. The media and culture are speaking lies that are contrary to the word of God. And not only have they become true in terms of how our culture is walking them out, but even the church who is supposed to be the pillar and ground of truth is getting in agreement with it. They've begun to impact us rather than us impacting them. We have lost our influence because we've lost the word. We need to get back to speaking the word. We need to get back in agreement with the promises and the principles of God. If we're going to see our lives, our families, our church, and this nation return to the Lord. May the Lord have mercy on us. And may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come before you tonight and just hear your word, to hear truth. We live in a world that is full of so many lies and deception and distractions and temptations. Father, thank you for a safe place to come and be built up by your word. We love you, Lord, and we so appreciate you and all that you have done. We acknowledge you, Father. Family, if you're in this place tonight, I want you to know something that in the Bible it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That means the word of God is God. So when you put the word in, you're putting God in. When you speak the word, you're speaking God out. That's his plan. We sing a song from time to time called I Speak Jesus. And we can speak who Jesus is by the mention of his name where there is power, but also by the, the substance of who he is, which is the word of God and truth. We need to make sure that we are putting the word in us. But before we can put the word in, that vessel must be cleansed. Several times throughout my time at a, our current home, you know, you'll see a vessel that's supposed to be in the kitchen outside for some reason you know the kids use it to, to dig in the dirt or you know somebody leaves it out there and it's just in the wrong place and used for the wrong purpose and it's it's still a vessel to be used for for a higher purpose not digging in the dirt but but feeding the body so you get it but you don't you don't bring it in and just start using that vessel if it's a dirty cup you don't just bring it in and fill it you, you first have to clean it God wants to use everyone for the high purpose that you were intended to. But the world is trying to take us and bring us to a place where we are being used in a manner that God did not intend. To speak lies, to be in gossip, to be self-centered, all those things. But God is saying, listen, come to me. 
that I might cleanse you and show you the higher calling that I have for you. If we are willing to accept that, that dirt that stains our soul is called sin. Sin is something that everyone has. It's a virus, not an action. When someone has a cold and they sneeze, they don't have a sneeze, they have a cold, and the manifestation of that is a sneeze. All humanity has a virus called sin, and our lies and our murderous hearts and all the things that we do wrong that we know we ought not are simply a symptom of something that is in our hearts that needs to be fixed, that God, and only God, has the antidote to. And that antidote is the Lord Jesus. Jesus came and paid the price for our sins, that we might be washed and cleansed by his blood. Why his blood? Because blood is a symbol of life, and when blood is spilled, it means a death has happened, and a life has been paid for. Jesus was the only one who could pay for all of humanity because it is through him that all man humanity was created because he is God. So he qualified to pay the price for you, to cleanse you from all your sins. And the Bible says this, that if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Then we can be filled with his spirit and his word and be a vessel used for honor. This is your purpose every single one whom he has created. And if you're here tonight and you've never had the opportunity to come to the Lord and say, Lord, I acknowledge that I have sin in me, that I've made mistakes, and I want you to wash and cleanse me so I can be used for the high calling and purpose that you have for me. Your high calling and purpose is this, one that you would know God, know him intimately, that you can know the one who made the heavens and the earth who formed the sun, the moon, and the stars and calls them all by name. You can know him personally. And then you get to be used as a vessel to make him known to others. To know God and to make him known. And if you've never done that, you can do it right now. You can start that process right now. And it's simply this, that you believe. That if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, who came to earth, died for your sins on the cross, but on the third day he was raised from the dead to prove that he was God and to prove that he has power to give eternal life to all who believe in him, he says, then you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from not knowing who you are, where you came from, and where you're going, and saved from the alternative of not knowing him, and that is being separated from him for all eternity. God is very black and white. There's light and there's dark. There's blessing, there's cursing. There's right and there's wrong. He is not a God of gray areas. He values himself too much to be wishy-washy. He is definite in who he is. And he wants you to be definite in who you are. A son of God, a daughter of God. And if you need to know that tonight, you want to come to him. The Bible says this in the Psalms, come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Know him. And I want to invite you to do one simple thing. If that's you, and you want to take a step of faith and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, just lift your hand and say, yes, that's me. I admit that I've made mistakes and I need Jesus. Anyone at all? Amen. I want to ask one other thing. If hearing the word tonight, there was a righteous, holy, freeing conviction that, hey, you know what? I'm going to start watching the words of my mouth, and I want to make a commitment to God to do that tonight. I want to, I want to empty myself of those things that would encourage me to speak contrary to God, and I want to fill myself with the word of God that I could speak him into my life and therefore receive all of what he wants from me. If that's you, just lift your hand up. Say, yes, I'm getting an agreement, and I'm going to begin shifting the words in my mouth. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Keep your hands up high. I just want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, before they lifted their hands, you saw their hearts. And I'm praying right now that you would meet them right where they're at. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are so kind and so merciful that it doesn't matter what mistakes we've made. You are there to meet us the moment there is a repentant heart and willingness to change. So, Father, touch every single heart whose hand is raised right now. 
I pray, Lord, that you would encourage them. I pray, Lord God, that you would remind them. I pray, Lord God, that you would instill in them a hunger for the word of God, that they would devour the word of God. It would become a part of their very soul. And in those moments where their flesh is challenged, that it is not their flesh that speaks, but their spirit, because their spirit has been strengthened in you. So, Father, touch them right now. I pray right now, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that they would speak your word, that they would know your word, that your word would dwell in them richly, and that your Holy Spirit would lead and guide them into all truth, and truth is what would proceed out of their mouth at all times. I thank you for it, Lord God, and I, I thank you for the blessing that comes on them because they make this decision, because they make this oath, because they make this commitment, and they purpose to take action. We thank you, and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give the Lord praise? He is worthy. He is worthy. Family, would you stand to your feet? We're going to leave this place the way we came in, with thanksgiving and praise on our lips to an awesome and mighty God who has given us great and precious promises to never leave us, to never forsake us, to be our protector, our provider. He is our priest. He is our strong fortress, our tower, our refuge. It is under his wings that we are protected. Lift your hands as we sing tonight. Come on, church. Let's, let's worship. <laughs>